Hey everybody and welcome back. So we just finished up talking about our semicircular canals which sense changes and accelerations and decelerations in angular rotation. Now we're going to talk about the otolith organs which are responsible for coding changes in acceleration uh, in our horizontal and our vertical planes. So the otolith organs um, have a very similar sort of setup to, um, to our uh, semicircular canals, but they achieve this in a very different way. The otolith organs are made up of a saccule and a utricle. Both of them are filled with fluid and they contain an area, uh, kind of a flat area, which kind of functions like the crista in the semicircular canals, except here we're going to call it a macula. Um, and so the hair cells are basically organized uh, on that macula. Um, generally, the saccule and the utricle are very, very sensitive to shear. In particular, those forces that run parallel to the plane of that macula where the hair cells are embedded. So the cilia of the hair cells are basically contained in a big gel cap, kind of like the cupula of the uh, that we saw in the semicircular, semicircular canals. Now, on the other hand, the way that the um, hair cells move for our otolith organs is going to be a little bit different. On top of this gel cap, we have what are called otoconia or otolith stones. So they basically kind of look like little crystals. So when I jokingly say you have crystals in your head, I'm not actually kidding. So when we have a gravitational force or we have inertial force like linear acceleration, that causes the stones to move around. And those stones are sitting right on top of that gel cap and that exerts uh, a lot of weight. So when gravity accelerates or decelerates or um, we accelerate or decelerate in a linear plane, um, those stones are going to move. That causes the hair cell, uh, that causes the gel cap to move, which then causes the hair cells to move. So here's what that kind of looks like. So here are our otolith organs. So here we have our utricle. Here we have our saccule. And you can kind of see that they've kind of cut open part of it so that you can actually see the macula. So the macula is basically going to be sensitive to anything that runs parallel to that. So the saccule, um, if the head is upright, the saccule will be very sensitive to acceleration or deceleration in a vertical plane. The utricle will be sensitive to acceleration or deceleration in the horizontal plane. So you can see that the hair cells are going to be embedded in this macula. Um, and additionally, we have a, a, a sort of a different structure here. So in the center of the macula, we have an anatomical area called a striola. And you can see that the hair cells are actually organized in such a way. In the case of the utricle, the hair cells are aligned towards the striola. In the case of our saccule, they are actually pointed away from the striola. And if we go further and we actually look at our otolith organs, so the hair cells are basically embedded in this macula. And on top of that, you can see they are embedded in the gel cap. And then here's our striola. That is our anatomical structure that is the center of this. And I also hope you notice that with the striola, notice that we do actually have that change in alignment. So here, the largest stereocilia is located here. Here, we basically reverse the orientation here. And so that's going to help us be maximally sensitive to those changes. So they're embedded in this gel cap. You can see the structure of the hair cells around the striola, and then the otoconia are on top of this gel cap. So as we have acceleration in a horizontal or a vertical plane, that causes the otoconia to move, which causes the gel cap to move, which causes our hair cells to deflect. <laughs> 
So how is amplitude coded in the otolith organs? Um, and it turns out that the principles are similar to what we saw for our semicircular canals. Bigger movements create bigger deflections in hair cells. Now, because we have a striola, that makes it a bit more complicated. So the hair cells are oriented in opposite directions based on where they are relative to the striola. So what this means is that if we have a tilt or an acceleration that maximally excites hair cells on one side of the striola, that creates maximal inhibition on the opposite side. So if I have a movement that causes my hair cells to deflect this way, so follow my, uh, follow my, um, my cursor. If I have a movement that causes deflection to go towards the right, in the case of these hair cells on this side of the striola, we're bending towards the largest one, so we're going to get excitation. That same rightward movement is going to cause deflection toward the smallest for this side of the striola, which creates inhibition. So generally, larger accelerations are going to move the otolith stones more, we get greater bending of the hair cells, and as such, larger changes in receptor potentials and greater changes in vestibular nerve firing. So again, we're looking for change. We are not looking for constancy. So what you can kind of see here, we have a case where um, the otolith organs may be sensitive to tilt due to gravity. So in this case, we start accelerating that tilt, and then we finally have movement at a constant tilt. Eventually, the uh, tilt will end. It will decelerate towards rest. You can see again that the hair cells and the uh, vestibular nerve fire at a baseline rate. As we start that tilt and get that short acceleration, we see a rapid increase in firing rate until a constant rate is reached. Now notice it doesn't drop back down. It just stays level. And then as we decelerate, we get a huge decrease in firing rate until we get to that resting level again. So how's direction coded in the otolith organs? Well, partially through orientation, as I kind of mentioned, when your head is upright, the plane of the utricle's macula is horizontal. The plane of the saccule's macula is vertical. So if your head's upright, your utricle is sensitive to earth horizontal acceleration, so it won't code for vertical acceleration. It will only code for horizontal, and the saccule will only be sensitive to vertical acceleration. So now let's move on and talk about how we actually perceive spatial orientation and these aspects related to angular rotation, uh, accelerate, linear acceleration, and tilt. So one of the things that's kind of interesting is that the vestibular sense up until very recently was very, very poorly understood. So what makes this kind of wild is that by the 1700s, we already had a pretty good understanding of how vision worked. We already had a pretty good understanding of how hearing worked. And yet, our perception of spatial orientation, back in the 1700s, it was actually believed that these massive fluid shifts in the head was what helped people figure out spatial orientation. Um, researchers ended up finding out that if you damage the vestibular sense, that sense of balance is basically knocked off kilter. So we began to understand that the vestibular organs were really critical for this. Um, but how do we examine spatial orientation today? Well, we can do so using a variety of different methods. And we're going to spend some time talking about these a bit. So we can look at things like thresholds. So we can look for an absolute threshold, the minimum motion that we would need to perceive a direction of angular rotation or acceleration or tilt. We could do something like magnitude estimation, where people give verbal reports of how much they think they've tilted, how much they've rotated using physical units like degrees or scales of 1 through 10. 
Uh, one of the cooler things that researchers have actually done is something called matching. So what you do is you align a line or a pole with perceived Earth vertical after being tilted. And this can either be done uh, visually by kind of creating that uh, matchup using your visual senses or by touching a pole and rotating it using haptic sensation. So let's start by talking about our perception of rotation. So here's what's kind of interesting. So here's, let's take a look at actual velocity before we talk about perceived velocity. So here's another case where we have a, a change in velocity. We have a rapid acceleration. And then we have um, a constant velocity uh, for about maybe 50 seconds, and then a deceleration and a return to zero. So what's kind of interesting is that we tend to get pretty used to constant rotational velocity after a second. So here we have the actual velocity in red. So we've got our acceleration, our constancy, and our deceleration. Here is our perceived velocity in purple. So you can see our perceived velocity rapidly accelerates to match our acceleration. And then as soon as that acceleration has reached a constant level, our perception drops back down to zero. So after about a minute, we may not actually perceive that we're rotating at all. Now, what's especially interesting about this is that here you can also see the response of the semicircular canals. Notice that the semicircular canals operate pretty quickly, just as our perceived change in velocity does. But notice that it drops off more quickly once that constancy is reached and is very, very slow, very, very quickly operating at zero during that period of constancy. When we get that rapid deceleration, our perception and our semicircular canals match up, but it takes a little bit more time for us to perceive a change in velocity relative to our semicircular canals. Now remember that our vestibular system is looking for change. The semicircular canal will not respond to constancy and our perception um, with constant velocity is that we may feel we're not actually rotating. But what I think is interesting, and I've noted this, the signals from our semicircular canals actually change faster than our perception does. Now, what's especially interesting, you'll kind of see here, um, so if we, so in this case, you can see that we are kind of lagging behind our actual semicircular canals, like our actual biology. Now, if we're doing something like, so here we're just talking about rotational velocity. Now, what you'll kind of notice is that we do get the sense that we're counter-rotating in the opposite direction. So generally, when we stop spinning, we tend to feel illusory rotation in the opposite direction. So once we stop spinning around in a circle, we kind of feel like we're moving in the opposite direction and we feel a sense of dizziness and imbalance. So how many of you are familiar with the concept of dizzy bat? Um, I was in Girl Scouts, and so Dizzy Bat was kind of a fun little game that you could play during, like, Girl Scout troop matchups or at PE if you had field day and different classes were competing with each other. Now, for those who don't know Dizzy Bat, basically what you were supposed to do is you uh, take a bat, you basically point the bat on the ground, then you put your head on the top of the bat and basically spin around in circles around the bat for a certain number of times. And then once you do that, then somebody will throw a pitch to you and then you have to try to hit it and run. Part of the reason that Dizzy Bat is so fun is that after you've spent a little bit of time spinning around in a circle, it becomes very, very hard to hit the ball, let alone be able to run to a base if you actually do manage to hit it. Now, this happens because of the responses of our semicircular canals. So again, 
your semicircular canals are looking for change. If you're rotating at a constant velocity, the hair cells don't deflect. And that's because when you move at a constant rotation, your endolymph and your cupula are moving together. If you accelerate or if you decelerate, the cupula will stop or change its motion, but the endolymph will always have a lag. So once that rotation stops, the cupula stops moving, but the endolymph is still moving. That deflects the hair cells and creates the perception that you're now rotating in the opposite direction that you were. Now, what about translation, moving around um, in X, Y, and Z planes? Um, can we actually determine the direction of our motion over small distances? And researchers have actually done this by basically putting people in the dark and having them be picked up in chairs while they're in the dark and they can't see where they're going. Uh, and then they have people recreate where, uh, basically recreate where they are now relative to where they were and how long it took them to get there. And it turns out that when we do this, people are really good at reproducing the direction of the movement they were carried in as well as the velocity of that motion. Now, translation is technically linear acceleration. And so what this tells us is that our brain does a very good job of taking linear acceleration signals from our otolith organs into account. And this creates a perception of linear velocity. Now, what about tilt? So one of the things that is a little bit tricky about tilt is that it's really easy to perceive tilt when you're vertical it's really easy to realize that you've tilted something if you're vertical. How do we perceive tilt when we are not vertical? And so uh, one of the ways that researchers have done this is by basically putting people on platforms and rotating those platforms certain amounts. So generally, we tend to find that if we are doing tilt, and we're laying down or we're not vertical, if that tilt is less than 90 degrees, we're pretty good at figuring out how much more we have been tilted. But something kind of interesting to note, um, if you tilt your head, a vertical bar of light might actually tilt in the opposite direction. So your book actually gives you a way that you can kind of try this if you're interested. Um, so you can investigate this in a completely dark room. Leave your door open just a crack so that you can see a tiny line of light in the doorway and hold your head in a tilted position. Generally, um, what a lot of people report is that the line tilts uh, when your head is tilted and generally it will tilt in the opposite direction that you tilted your head. Um, here is another example of how researchers have looked at tilt. So what you're looking at here is a haptic sensor. So they basically have to indicate uh, how much they have tilted uh, for various types of tilts. So here we have a pitch tilt towards the back. Here we've got perfectly vertical. Here we've got a pitch forward tilt. And what you can actually see is the perceived tilt versus the actual tilt, you can actually see that for the most part, most of these data points are falling on this straight line, indicating that people are pretty good at indicating how much they've been tilted. This is also true for, um, this is also true for other types of movements as well. So here, for example, we've got one for a uh, roll tilt. So in this case, they have a roll movement toward the right. Here we have vertical. Here we've got a roll movement toward the left. You can see that this one gets a little bit more difficult to do uh, once you've actually rotated more than 50 degrees. But by and large, people are still kind of falling on this line, indicating that they're realizing how much they've tilted and they're actually pretty accurate. And then finally, we have a yaw movement. So here we've got yaw to the left and yaw to the right. Once again, people are pretty good at figuring out how much they've tilted. 
So now we're going to stop here. We'll have one more lecture. We will talk about how our vestibular sense integrates with other senses, and then we will talk about what happens when our vestibular sense fails. I'll see you next time.